and welcome to another episode of Maine's Unstream. I'm joined today by a good friend and uh, colleague in many ways, JJ Ferrari. JJ, how are you going? Welcome to the show. I am so excited to be here. Maine Unstream. I love it. What a, I just love it. So, yeah. Well, we're, we're really pleased to have you here. And for those who don't know JJ, uh, I've known JJ for many years. I first knew JJ as John. Uh, so let me just tell you a very little bit about her. JJ is, uh, well, she's a very confident, fun-loving person, very genuine is how I've come to know her. Um, and she can be a bit peculiar, but and some people have also said she's a bit of an acquired taste. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll put my hand up there, and, and in, the, in the best possible way. So she loves science, she loves puzzles, she loves patterns, uh, something else we have in common, I see things in patterns. And um, those these she loves those things because they help her to feel safe and in taking the risks that she takes. Now, uh, apart she's had a really interesting career, right? Now we'll get into some of the business stuff later on because you're going to be so impressed with the stuff that she's done, and this is one of the one of the many reasons I love her. Uh, but there's a she's more commonly known these days, or until these days at least, as the transition specialist. And that's because she transitioned her gender, as I alluded to. I, stood, I first knew JJ as John. But that's really only about, you know, just under 20%, 19.7% of, of the reason um, that she's known as that. There's another 80.3% why she's known as a transition specialist. It's got nothing to do with gender, all right? Yeah. So uh, actually she's been around, uh, she's been through 22 personal life transitions, and she's helped yeah. thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people to transition themselves, transition their teams, transition their business. Mate, I could go on and on about you. Uh, <laughs> and I could go on and on about you shortly. Uh, and we're going to name drop a few people, not because we need to name drop, it's just because these are people you've worked with and helped mm. at the highest level of personal yeah. development and business. Mm. All right, so let's, let's focus in maybe just briefly so we can get that out of the way for a lot of people. Sure. Um, on the nineteen point seven percent. Yep. And um, you know, tell us what. Um, I'm sure you get a whole bunch of questions about it, and you probably get bored with all of them, you know, eventually. But uh, everyone tunes into the same radio station, right? W I F M. What's in it for me? Right. What was in it for you? It's a great question, and to be honest with you, I, I don't get I don't get tired of the question about um, transitioning my gender, because it's it's definitely a part of my story, um, and it's not something that I'm ashamed of. It's something it took me a long time to finally you know get involved in doing. Um, but it's, it's a part of my story. But the thing is that what most people don't look at when they, when they hear that I've been through my gender transition, they never ask about my evolution. Um, they never really ask me about, um, could you come back on? Sure, is that really disconcerting to see yourself only on the screen? <laughs> it is. Yes, I like talking to wow. you. I'd rather talk yeah, with cool. you, okay? Okay, I'll, I'll hang around, that's absolutely fine. I'll hang around for the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like that. Um, but I find that most people never ask me about my evolution um, or ask me about what I really got out of it. So thank you for asking that question. Um, I got so many things out of it, Paul. Um, people will say, oh, yeah, you got you, you, you know, you transition your gender. And most people think that's the goal. That's it. And it, it isn't. When I was going through it, leading up to it, I I had to stop and think, what do I want to be known for? What do I want to get out of this? Um, I didn't have any clue what it was going to mean to live female. So how can I set goals around that? I didn't know how a woman thought. I didn't know what a woman's life pattern really was. So I really didn't have any ways to set goals around that. So what I had to think about is what I wanted to do, not who I was going to become at first. But see, the thing is, a lot of people get stuck in that idea, right? Because they actually get stuck in what they're about to become. And they call themselves something like transgender. And you can get stuck in that word. And then that's all the people really see you as, right? And it was something yeah. I was adamant that I was not going to get stuck in. So I realized that it wasn't who I was, and it wasn't what I was, that 
transitioning my gender was simply a process that I needed to go through so that I could live the way that I always knew myself. And it's not, it's not, um, what's the word we use all the time? It's not authentic. This is not authentic, okay? Mm -hmm. The word that I use for it is genuine. And you might say, well, what's the difference? Well, they're not the same word. Authentic people say, now I'm being authentic. Does that mean you were lying before? I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. But genuine to me means fluidity. It means that I'm always in the constant state of change and I don't stop and go, now I'm authentic. Because when you do that, that's actually being, you know, not authentic. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really cool. And when I get the transcript of that, you just created a great trans, uh, a distinction between the two that I'm going to immortalize somewhere in a meme because that's very, very cool. Love that. Thank you. Um, but it's really what I got. And, you know, you get a lot of experience, very different experience as well going through this. So, you know, all the things that I went through in my gender transition, because you lose everything, Paul. I mean, you really lose your life, your career, you know, your slate gets wiped clean. And a lot of people that's very disconcerting. But for me, I was like, I love risk. I love uncertainty, right? And I love yeah. patterns. And so because I love those things, I'm the type of person who usually jumps into the deep end. Um, even in business, when people have a problem that's impossible to solve, I'm usually the one who gets called. Why? Because <laughs> that's where I'm most comfortable is in being uncomfortable. And so, yeah. you know, letting myself grow through this whole process was just an outstanding experience. I didn't have to live up to anyone's idea of what I was going to be, nor did I have any standards. So I got to organically grow into Joanna and then figured out that I wasn't Joanna. How weird is that, right? Because <laughs> I went, John, Joanna, wait a minute. No, JJ. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Here's what I JJ want to come back to Joanna. Sorry, go on. Yeah. 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 So here's what JJ ended up meaning. So going through Joanna was going through all of the extremes that I needed to go through to, to let myself get into a situation where I believed in my feminine side, where I could act from it, where I could think from it, where I had actually created synergy in my body and my mind and my spirit um, about who I was. I was then looking at that and calling myself Joanna. But when I stopped and realized, and this was only like um, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, what I realized was that Joanna wasn't being genuine. That was an authentic stop along my way. Right? Yeah, I get that. yeah. It, was, it was the other end of the spectrum. You, Bingo. You, it was you, dresses. And then it was, back and yeah. So it was dresses. It was makeup. It When my lipstick comes off today, that's it. It doesn't go back on. <laughs> you know, I didn't have to do that for us. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, when you actually start to call yourself and live in this authentic bubble, you actually reduce what you actually learned from your past. And I in no way wanted to get rid of or reduce who my boy self was because I had such a successful life and I had a very fun mm. life. I've done more things than most people have ever dreamed of doing. Right. I know it's crazy. And we're going to get <laughs> into that. And, and actually, you know, and also just briefly before we get into that, uh, cause you were saying about how, you know, the, the slate got wiped clean. Yeah. Um, I recall in the conversation we had, you mentioned that, you know, uh, it, it literally got wiped clean. Clients uh, fled. You know, like crazy. Heard, like, <laughs> Like suddenly, suddenly, you no longer suited their model of someone who was able to help them drop ballistics, which is what you were doing. Yeah. Um, and and they fled. So we'll get we'll get into that in a second. But oh, go on. Yeah. Well, it's it's really it's it's simple to understand, right? It's it's simple to understand what happens to your world. Um, at first, how do you trust that? It's really difficult to 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 trust somebody goes. I'm not this, I'm this, right? And you bought into that person, lived with that person, knew that person, trusted that person as X, and now they're telling you they're Y, 
right? Which is in no way meant to be, it's, uh, you know, about the chromosomes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not getting genetic on you guys. Right, exactly. You know, but, but the thing is, so they kind of look at you and say, how do I trust you if you don't trust you? And so you have to find a way to learn to love, trust, accept, and believe in yourself again. And when you do, like anyone else and in any other situation, right, people will then follow suit and, and do that. And that's where JJ came from. JJ was me saying, I trust who I was. I trust what I've been through. And I bring now all of me to the world. I bring John and Joanna, also known, AKA JJ. Yeah. <laughs> That's a long story to get to that, isn't it? <laughs> it, it is, but, and I'm sure we could go a lot deeper. And frankly, you know, the, the whole um, Joanna period was where you were doing all the hard work to figure out yeah. you know, who am I, what am I doing, all this one. Now, you know, the one of the interesting things is that um, a, a young lady, she's, I think she's 15 now. I know she's the daughter of a good friend of ours. I've known her since she was four. Since the day she was four, I don't even, I don't even know whether I should be saying she or he, but since the day she was four, she's been saying, I'm a boy, I'm a boy, I'm a boy. Did you have yeah. anything like that yourself? I mean, I realize that's probably one of those questions that one gets, but uh, I, from personal experience with this person over the last 11 years, um, she's been like, I'm a boy, I'm a boy, I'm a boy. And um, yeah. she was a transition. No, um, I, mine was much more internalized. Um, although I spent a lot of time playing, you know, dress up with my sisters, um, my dad and mom both recognized it when I was young. And by the time I was seven, my dad actually said, no more dress up, right? And then my mom actually gave me the outlet by um, from eight years old till 14 years old, giving me the outlet of Halloween um, and actually dressing as a girl. Right. But um, I, I knew, but I didn't know what to call it. Mm. And so I always was rugged. And even in, even now, I mean, you, you know me, Paul, I mean, I'm, I'm very much a, a tomboy. If, if, you know, if you wanted to put any kind of a label on me, because I'm still rough and tumble and I don't, um, I don't aspire to be um, a princess, you know what I mean? So I never wanted to go all the way to that other side. So even though I knew it inside and I almost transitioned when I was 29, um, it wasn't, that I, I was still happy being a boy. I had a really good, you know, a good run at being a boy. Okay, cool. Well, I didn't know about the twenty nine, but tell me this thing. You know, we live we live in a society which is gradually tra gradually transitioning from this binary male female into multiple genders. And quite frankly, if I look at the dating sites, there are apparently thirty three genders or something, which may even for me, will, <laughs> even for me, is a little bit over the top. But I, I'm not going to judge, right? But um, do you do you you know? Personally, I don't care whether a person's a, a male, female, whatever. They're a person. They're a human being, and they 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 come. You know what they bring to the table is as a person. And it's got for me. It's got nothing to do with their gender. Do you have? Um, do you identify more? I mean, obviously, you transition into uh, what people would say. Oh, you're a female, but do you identify primarily or only as female, or how do you see how do you see that whole gender question? Well. I think there's two two parts to that. One is how I see myself is I call myself female. A lot of people will call me a woman, but I've had a very different um, life than most women have. I've had been very blessed that I've I've been able to understand more about what a woman goes through. When I did um, I did the vagina monologues. I'm not sure if you know what that is, but it's a um, oh, it's a, a stage a stage play where uh, they did over. Um, over 200 interviews of women in very different situations to capture some snapshots of what women around the world have actually endured. And when I actually learned about that, I was like, man, I was so white, so male. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't, I don't, I didn't grow up as a girl. Um, and so it's been difficult to just jump in and call myself a woman. I live female. Yes, I'm, I'm a very female. My energy is extremely female, mm -hmm. right? Um, yep. But I've actually let myself go through all of the stages. So 
um, immediately coming through transition, you know, your mind and your body, you have no idea who you are. So you have almost zero confidence like you would in your, you know, 10s, 15 year olds. Um, and you, you have to start to explore all that again. And I think when you just jump in and call yourself a woman, um, you skip over a lot of the really good learning, the really great experience, because mm. it deepens your understanding of yourself, right? But when it comes to all the other gender ideas, and I call them that because if you look at most of the non-binary, most non-binary are typically aged you know, very young to 30s mm -hmm. that really identify with a lot of those. And look, we all went through phases where we called ourselves different things. In the 60s and 70s, we called ourselves hippies, right? In the 70s, yeah. you had metalheads, right? In the 90s, late 80s and early 90s, you had grunge. You know, a lot of times it's based on, you know, music or you see this movement happening. And non-binary just happens to be a movement where you can actually name your own movement, right? Um, if if you go on to uh, Tumblr, you'll find there's over 120 different non-binary non gender types. But the thing that I really object to is throwing all those underneath the political term transgender, because mm. non-binary gender, 90 some percent of the time has nothing to do with transitioning, right? Nor does cross-dressing, nor does being a oh. drag queen. Well, so absolutely nothing. Right, exactly. But what we've done is we've, we've actually changed the definition, as we have done for many words um, these days. Um, and, you know, now we've actually made it all about gender, not about transition. So there are very, very, only a couple actually um, groups of people underneath the umbrella term transgender that are actually mm -hmm. transitioning their gender. The rest are just opposed to gender as we've seen it. So I don't have yeah. any problem mm -hmm. with different types of gender. What I do have a problem with is um, people who get so single-minded, right? And don't realize that all of this stuff about gender and sexuality is a brand new freedom. And human beings, when they have a, an abundance of freedom, they suck. They suck at it. Why? Because we create much more chaos than we do innovation with it. And we demand our rights, but we can't tell anybody what it actually gives back to us, society, you know, economically, environmentally, technologically, politically. So I, I, I have a problem with that when we try and force people to pay attention to us because of what we've done with our gender. That's called coercion, not innovation. Yep, I agree. We've got enough of that going on at the moment. So um, just one last question, which uh, before, okay. I want to get into the business stuff. And it's got to do, because uh, actually what you just said is a good segue into it, because there's the uh, the United Nations Sustainable uh, Development Goals, right? Without yeah. us going deep into them. One of them is about diversity. Um, from the way I see what they're doing with diversity through the SDGs, though, it's all about um, uh, you know more more diversity for women and more women in jobs and more power to women and education to women and all the rest of it. So it's right. still you know it's still focusing down that binary route as opposed to diversity for me would be encompassing all genders. And, and I get what you're saying about the 30s up to th up to the 30 year old plus ish where they yeah. just you know they're giving themselves a label, but beyond that. There are people who have transitioned and, you know, it doesn't seem to encompass, for me, it doesn't seem to encompass that. What's your take yeah. on, on the SDGs? Well, in the if first it, place, I think we, we've got diversity wrong. Um, yeah. Diversity is not about people. Diversity is about diversity. And so what we've actually done with diversity as it is, um, we've actually done something brilliant that people don't actually understand. And so they actually see it as um, a soapbox for them to stand on to get their rights met for their specific group. So, but if diversity is not about people, you have to ask, what is it about? You, if you've got all these people jumping on and saying diversity and inclusion is what we need to actually, and you need to meet our rights, government, business, society, right? 
that's wrong yeah. because one group's thinking about diversity and their rights typically interferes or steps on another group's rights. Right. So we yeah. hear about women, we hear about transgender, we hear about LGBTI, and we think that's what diversity is. That's not what diversity is. We've actually left off a lot of different groups of people. What about people who aren't involved in anything like transitioning their gender or um, a woman who doesn't want to go and become successful at work? How do those soapboxes then meet that person's needs? They really don't, right? And so what we have to look at is and call diversity something different. And diversity is actually freedom. Okay, inclusion is choice, but we're not giving people choice. We're actually taking diversity and say, you believe in what I say about diversity or, right, you're part of the opposition. Yeah. So we actually take away people's ability to choose to be included by actually um, giving this narrow idea of diversity. So diversity is freedom. Think about it this way. If diversity is freedom and I'm working on a project at work, for example, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that I need to have somebody from India, somebody from China, somebody from, I don't need to do that. I need diversity of ideas so that I can actually grow at the best possible rate, make sure that it's sustainable, right? But an, I need a, an influx of new ideas. That's diversity, right? It doesn't mean that the best ideas are going to come from a man or a woman or someone who's transgender or someone, you know, who's non-binary called star. Those don't make any difference at all, right? What's important is that we understand the freedom that comes with diversity. And, and human beings have a tendency to create chaos versus innovation when they've got an abundance. Now, watch this equation. If I have, mm -hmm. I give you an abundance of freedom and I give you an abundance of choices, right? As an equation, it can only equal one of two things, chaos or innovation. So what we have to do and what you're seeing is that human beings will come back out of this. They will, because, mm -hmm. you know, even this is the way I, that I would phrase it to you, even cool. Martians, aliens passing by Earth are like, lock the fucking doors because that, that planet is crazy, right? Um, because we're just in this, totally. seriously, but we're just in this state of growth. And when you're in a growth state, and that's where we're really at, new freedoms, new choices, everybody wants to rule. And so we're not actually using the right definitions. We'll come back around to it right? Where we'll actually look at the freedoms and go, oh, wait a minute. If we were actually playing nice, we'd be actually doing a better job of diversity and creating freedom for all of us, not just for this small pocket of people. That's my thing. That. No, that's great. Thank you. That's I love that. And uh, what, what occurs to me is, you know, um, life is chaos. Uh, we have enough of it. So make the right choice, which is the other direction. Yeah. You know, yeah, well, we, we, I love chaos. Chaos yeah. is absolutely wonderful because when mm. you create it on purpose, um, you actually get to your outcomes faster. Um, but most people don't actually yeah. understand that concept. So, yeah. No, they like to have things nice and neatly, tightly boxed away, don't they? You know, especially in, yeah. in, in business. So let's let's turn to the 80.3% of what your transition is, right? Bring Yay, it on. Finally. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> hanging around for that. Because this is uh, really cool. So, I mean, that's a little cool, but this is really cool. So, yes. um, for those who don't know, JJ, uh, in her in her former life as John, or in no, it's not in former life, in, in her earlier life, sorry, as John. Um, <laughs> John was the, uh, JJ was the CEO for the Tony Robbins organization. And you've worked uh, high up with Bob Proctor, with Jay Abrahams. Pretty much name anybody in that personal development, business development space who is anybody, and um, JJ will have that on her, you know, I wouldn't say resume, but on your um, on your checklist somewhere as, as, you know, ticked off. Yeah. Um, tell us, what, you know, a lot of people are struggling right now. Um, a lot of people are always struggling, let's be honest, um, especially right now, I guess, with this, this, you know, people are out of work, they're trying to figure out what to do. Right. Um, you've, you've reinvented yourself so many times. Yeah. Um, 
and you have you have a wealth of knowledge on how to take knowledge and productize it. You have a wealth of knowledge on how to develop a market. You have a wealth of knowledge on how to develop a business. Mm. I don't even know where we're going to start with this because uh, <laughs> we might just have to come back 3,000 times and to finish uh, it off. Well, maybe we could focus, um, focus this because in any situation, especially in the current um, economical environment, um, what you're actually seeing is that businesses are doing what they've always done. And there's this history of pulling back on, on spending money right? Um, and what you're seeing is that people are, are really starting to do a lot more analysis. But if you don't know how to do analysis, right, you won't do a good analysis. And so some people yeah. will do quantitative, some people will do qualitative, but very few businesses will actually pull both of those types of information together and get a combined insight so that they can yeah. look at their business you know, from a, this unique lens. And when you do that, you actually start to very quickly be able to eliminate a lot of the potential problems that happen in a business. So I, I would actually say that there's a, a simple way to learn to create propelling goals, not just generalized goals. And you can do it as an individual, you can do it as a team, or you can do it as a business. And I highly recommend it. Um, as a business. Um, there's two things that preclude us from succeeding, um, I, in my belief, Paul, that I've seen. So in working in over 1,800 businesses, you know, either as a trainer or a coach or consultant, um, what you see is that most people don't actually understand the idea of a purpose, right? They think it's this cute little you know, sentence that you write down and that you tell everybody, but you don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah, right? But a purpose, like <laughs> well, a purpose is really a, a measurement tool. And what you do is you actually have to think through it, talk through it, act through it, and measure through it. And when you do that with a purpose, right, you quickly find out that you don't have a purpose um, yeah. because you can actually measure your purpose against those. Would you want to act from it? Would you want to think from it? Do you talk through it? So mine is knowledge to grow on. So whether I'm speaking or I'm doing an interview or, um, you know, I'm, I'm training a group of professionals and how to grow their career, it doesn't make any difference what it is. I am always there to actually give knowledge. Now, does knowledge mean that everyone believes in it, loves it, right, and turns to it? No. Sometimes I'm provoking. Sometimes I'm the contrarian in the room, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm never the smartest person in the room, but I'm usually the most studied person in the room. Um, and I really love debate and negotiation because it's where you find out whether or not, you know, your purpose stands up and whether or not what you're working on is real and true. Right. Yeah, so that's a good point. Yeah. So I love, I love making sure that people have got a purpose. But then from there, once you've got an overall purpose, every single day, all you're doing is working on that to improve it, not just for yourself, right? For the purpose of taking care of your clients, right? Or your future clients or your employees, um, as yep. well as your vendors. And your purpose should take care of all of those. But I'll give you what, what I've learned is probably the quickest way to create propelling goals. It's number one to yeah, pick a goal. Like there's a lot of um, business owners out there like you and I who have, they're the only one in the business, right? At the yeah. time. And yeah. so what we have a tendency to do is set a million goals, right? We set hundreds of goals or thousands of goals. And the thing is that we, we don't actually work on a hundred or a thousand of goals. It comes back to that same idea of diversity. When you've got too much freedom in your thinking, right? You create more chaos than you do innovation. So if you were able to pick a single goal, and this is what I would tell anybody, whether you're an individual and you're out of work or you've got a business and you need to grow it through tough times, pick a goal, right? And what you do from there is you make sure that you can actually communicate the specifics. And there are three things that you need to communicate. You need to communicate, okay, what is my baseline? Where am I starting? And what's my target? And most people will actually pick really ridiculous things like, I want to grow by 10 times or 20 times in the next 30 days. It's like, 
All right, let's get realistic now, right? And they've never gone by two times in the last next 30 days, right? Yeah, you've only gone, you know, 10 times down, but now you want to grow a thousand times up. It doesn't work. So what you really want to do is make sure that you communicate the specifics. One, what's your baseline? Where's the target that you want to get to? The second thing you need to look at is what's really important about it? What's going to keep you committed to the goal? And when you actually start to write these communicative specifics, you start to understand whether or not your goal is real. Is it going to get you the best, most important return on investment, right? So you can see that even as an individual, if you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm out of work and I need to find new work. If you didn't like your job, for example, if you didn't like what you were doing before and you go looking for another job in that same area, you're probably not going to find what you're looking for, right? Because you're looking for something better. You're right, probably right. looking for more money, but you really haven't communicated this. That. What's that? I said, good luck on that one in these times. Yeah, exactly. So what, what you end up doing is you end up having to look at the, the specifics of it. Um, what's important about it? What do I really want? Why do I want this job? And you can actually transition a lot of your skills, responsibilities, a lot of your knowledge, and even your results can transition to you know, brand new areas. And I think that that's a really important skill to have is being able to communicate your specifics. Um, and then we have a tendency to actually build our goals out too long right? Where we actually go in the next year, I'm going to, nobody yeah. focuses that long, right? So, and I, I'll and give you as an example. Things that can happen. <laughs> well, yeah, you and I, yeah, no, you and I had a conversation um, and we talked about um, your book and all of those things. And in less than six weeks, right? You, you turned around and, and you had it actually going. You started main on yep. stream, boom, like this. Why? Because it made sense and it was the right time. You could communicate yep. the specifics, right? You knew where you were at and what you wanted it to do. So, you know, you're actually a really strong proponent for propelling goals, which I absolutely love. That's why we're friends. <laughs> yep. The thing is, though, that you do something else that a lot of people don't do, and that is you focus your resources. So instead of going like this with, you know, with all the resources, you actually start making them all go in a direction. And when you do that, it's laser beam focus, right? It actually grows your goal faster than you ever expected it to happen. And that's a really powerful thing. And it also allows you to focus through external problems. Um, and this is the way I describe it. When you actually get really, really focused, start driving forward in that way, um, external factors can't get in. Um, think of it this way. If I put a ship in water, it floats, right? But yep. if I put water in a ship, it sinks. Where the ship, right? If I let everything yep. from the outside in, I will sink. It will actually send me into depression, anxiety, or any other number of you know things that we actually experience when we actually let all of the world's crap in. But if you are so focused, there's no way for the external factors to get in to that focus, right? But if I leave it open, floodgates. This way, yeah. I actually can drive through anything. Actually, when you were just saying that, and that visual of you know the the the, the peak or the fallow, mm -hmm. whatever, it drives through. But if you open your hands up, you're going to start capturing everything in that vessel. And right. it's going to go turmoil, 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 flowing over the sides and nothing is going to get through. But if you're doing exactly. that, you're going to be driving to your... Yeah, exactly. Cool. Because when you when you do this, what happens is um, it does it, it actually makes it more complex and it leads you to do what most human beings do, and that is not make a decision. And when you don't make a decision, you can actually sink your ship quicker. And so it's really important to understand what that single idea does to a goal, right? I pick a goal, I communicate it well, and then I focus everything on getting it going. Why? Because it's if you look at the bottom, right, that looks like a, the spray of what comes out of a rocket when it takes off, doesn't it? It does, and, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And what that is, is propellant. It's getting the goal mm -hmm. going okay. so fast that it picks up momentum. Right. And you have a really good example of that. 
What's that? I said, I've really <laughs> pregnant pause. <laughs> <laughs> so oh my really god example, since we spoke since we last, yeah i know what's over there uh since we last spoke um and that is you know I was, uh, i've got all this stuff myself in 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 this virtual warehouse of 30 years of business experience yeah. um and after we last spoke i went and mapped it all out and said okay well this is what i this is this is where i think it should be i should be focusing my energy and i made a conscious choice about that and then all of a sudden uh, two opportunities, one after the other within the space of a, a week and a half, two opportunities came up. And, and both opportunities had the potential to drag me left, respectively right, of right. where I put my focus. And I'm like, well, that's a good opportunity, and that's a good one. Um, oh, maybe I can try and do them all. No, I can't because, quite frankly, they're all sort of compressing into the same time and space. Right. Like, it's just not going to happen. But by having that focus that, that, that you just spoke about and that we spoke about a few weeks back, um, it allowed me to see how I could actually bring both opportunities back to the center right? and then let them expand naturally their own way along a course that was going to be happening anyway. But instead yeah. of dividing my time, instead of being like Hitler at Barbarossa, right? that was where yeah. the poor bastard went down. <laughs> oh, they're going to kill me for saying the poor bastard. That's where the Germans fell apart. We'll say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh, this one will be banned on YouTube too. Right. Anyway, uh, <laughs> wouldn't be my first time. You should see my naked videos. <laughs> oh, please, yes, please. Um, um, but, but you're so right. What happens is when I get that momentum going, everything is going to try and pull you left and right. So it focuses two of your key elements. It focuses how you use your time, because you and I talked about you've got that two hour period that you use every day, which by the way is more than ample time to get any goal going. Two hours a day is a lot of time to use to create a goal. But once I actually know how to use my time, it actually teaches me how to use my thinking. And you actually showed it exactly right. When I actually bring something back to center, right, and I've got it here, then that one thing can open up. But if I, if I don't find those things that are actually starting to attack my trajectory, um, right, if I don't find them to be something I want and I keep focusing on it, guess what happens with the trajectory? You end up going towards it and you never reach the destination that you want. And if you take a human being, you have to remember human nature, human beings, they go through and they miss a goal once, twice, three, four, five times. You miss a goal five times that you have set for yourself, you're probably not going to try goals or you're probably going to say something like, I don't believe in that bullshit anymore, yeah. right? I know and so, and that's, like that, yeah. yeah. So, so when you actually start to 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 really focus your resources and communicate to yourself. This is what I call a goal, okay? I don't actually call it a goal. So it is a relevant and powerful promise that I make to myself about a must have experience. Think about that for a second. It has to be relevant. It has to be powerful, right? Which gives me my commitment and mm -hmm. It, it's it's a promise. I make a promise to myself, right? You can't expect other people to keep their promises to you if you can't keep them to yourself, because that means you probably don't keep your promise to other people. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, you're right? not being genuine, are you? No. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then what I do is I ha I keep thinking about the experience that I'm going to have when I achieve it, not the goal itself. What's the experience? If I define that aftermath, oh my gosh, it's, it's absolutely amazing how that keeps your motivation going. Whereas if I just keep saying, I achieved my goal, I achieved my goal, I achieved my goal, sooner or later, I'm like, ah, you know, forget it. <laughs> no, yeah. But if I make it, have experience Woo. that that is that is so cool and i'll tell you why i think that anyway goals you're right so many people they just get fed up with setting goals you know when it's like oh well you didn't do it the right way or whatever you know but the word that that word goal you know as much as there's a goal in football soccer yeah. or whatever um 
That's the place to get to, and you have to keep getting there. It just it it's. I think we've become desensitized to it. And yeah. what's really cool about yeah, and and, and that must have experience. The thing, the thing I find really cool about that is for me, the you know uh, life is simply a process of experiences. Experiences come down to two things: what's happened and the story we tell ourselves, ex, uh, aka the meaning we give to it. And so. Right. It's a, if it's a must-have experience, we're giving it a meaning and we're making it important in our lives. So it's a relevant, powerful promise Yeah. for a must-have experience. I love yeah. it. Right. You, there's a, you, there's you, a social you, meme coming up after this thing. Watch out for a <laughs> But you know what's really cool about it is you minimize the amount of um, external motivation that you need. It's so much easier to get yourself pumped up because if you make a list of all the things you're going to actually enjoy once it's going, right, it then starts to also clarify what else you probably would want to do to make sure that, you know, that goal happens and that experience, um, you know, actually gets better. Um but there's one more part. There's one more part to doing all the, and that last part is you need to have a process. And this is where people mostly fall down. So if communicating to yourself or to others about the specifics of your goal doesn't get you, if not knowing how to focus your um, your resources doesn't get you, then having a process. Um, for making sure you can stay on track, like measuring it. How do I progress it? How do I negotiate? How do I get others involved? Because what most people don't realize, Paul, is that your personal goal or your business goal is a team sport, right? I want to hit this goal. I'm never going to do it all on my own but we never figure out who can actually give us the best result, get us there faster, get us there with, you know, the least amount of time, get us there for the least amount of cost, keep us there when we get there. And so we actually choose the wrong type of experts um, to bring into our life, into our business, mm. trust the wrong people. And it becomes really important to learn how do you choose a coach or consultant or the people who are going to be on your team? And mm -hmm. so that's how I usually talk to people about how to be thinking during this time or any other tough time, right? Um, it gets you to the point where you have some control, but you actually are creating growth. You can live through the uncertainty that we all have to go through. But as you're going through it, you're you're hitting these little plateaus and it's a good place to stop and just go, good job. I really did a good job. I brought the right people in. Yay. Good job. We're going to keep going. Mm -hmm. And so you actually learn how to do that. Um, and I think it's really just it's been a very simple way for me to teach people a unique way to achieve what they want and get their mind focused. And. I know that you have a really cool quote about putting the right, because you're absolutely right. You know, you, you put you can't put crap people into your business. I know you have a really good quote around um, uh, getting the right information, the right advice in your business, which uh, has to do with if you eat dog shit, then you're going to get cancer. <laughs> <laughs> so you mean, so what, what I call them is um, I usually grow experts into pros. Hmm. Um, and I think that's what you're alluding to in my, um, what I mean, uh, is that what you mean? My pros? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, experts um, are a dime a dozen. And I know a lot of experts that are I'm going to polarize your audience for a second, but I promise I'll bring them back. Um, there are too many experts <laughs> out there. Well, <laughs> oh, I forgot you're irreverent. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what, what we have a tendency to do is we we call people experts and they're not experts. They're experts at marketing. Marketing are not experts in marketing. Experts mm. in marketing, you know, consulting services or information are not experts, right? They're salespeople. Yeah. They're entrepreneurial salespeople. Does that mean they're wrong? No, you know, you can learn something from anyone, but that does not make them pros. Those are not the people you really want in your business. So what makes, turns an expert into a pro? Pros to me is an acronym. It stands for predictable, 
stands for reliable, it stands for organized and simply scalable. And that's how you actually measure if someone can help you. Have they been predictable with their information, with their clients, right? If they're not, then right then and there, I would not bring them in, right? Are they reliable? Yeah. Well, you can find that out really quickly, really easily. See, I think it's really important to not only be genuine, but to have a great reputation and to maintain relevant, right? So that you actually get mm -hmm. referred and requested. Um, but most people don't actually take that into consideration. They think um, the expert, right? The dime a dozen expert will just keep marketing and marketing and marketing and not worry about everybody that they've talked to or injured, but actually work on, I made money, so I must be doing okay. And so, um, yeah, I really have a, a difficult time with all of the self-proclaimed experts um, who are not predictable, reliable, organized, or simply scalable. And that could damage a business. Yeah. I mean, they may, they, you know, they say that it takes 10,000 hours or something to become an expert in something. I guess by that token, I'm, by that measure, I'm expert in about six different things. But, um, <laughs> yeah, <I'm, laughs> you're, yeah, you know, there, there's, you're right. There's a significant, there's a significant difference. And tell me this, yeah. I, mean, I remember from one of our, our very first conversations we had in the last, you know, whatever period, short period, uh, we were talking about niches. Right, and and uh, mm -hmm. you know, everyone, we'll wrap this up shortly. But I really want to, I, I know that JJ has a very, very interesting and very cool and very effective way of talking about your niche market. Now, in traditional terms, people keep talking about a demographic or an avatar or whatever, and your focus is more about personality. I do. I I believe that when which, you are actually, way, what's that? So, which, by the way, I've adopted. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's important to, you know, when you see the difference is demographic is a strategy, but when you are actually looking for the right people, that's a principle. Why? Because a principle doesn't change. I don't have to change who I'm looking for. Can I expand my market at any time? I can. And typically a niche market will actually expand itself organically. You know, there's a lot of natural growth from starting on, on focusing in a niche. But when you focus in a niche, you actually attract the, the right types of people. And you can find those people people quite easily because there are other people who have actually found them. Um, there are a lot of other experts who are more like you. Maybe they have the same type of values as you or a similar product, but they don't, um, they don't have the integrity of your product or the depth of your product. Or maybe they're just somebody that's good to collaborate with. So you're really looking for two things when you're looking for a niche market. Um, and I'm actually going to contradict myself in a second because I'll give you the second half of that conversation, right? But the first thing I'm looking for is I want to find who are the experts in my niche. So I can look and say, who are the collaborators? Who are the competitors, right? Um, the ones mm -hmm. and how you delineate between the two are how they match your values, your beliefs, and what you're trying to accomplish, right? Um, and predictable, reliable, organized, scalable, right? Um, and then what I want to look at is do, are they attracting the right size of business within that? Because I might have somebody who is an absolute startup, um, and who doesn't even know how to get started in their business, for example. And there are a lot of people out there that are much better suited to talk to that person than me. So I would say no to that person, but I would make sure that one of my collaborators was somebody that could handle that, right? So this mm -hmm. way I can stay very focused and I can grow my products, grow my service. I can learn about what information is needed to make sure that I'm giving them knowledge to grow on, not bubblegum information, right? And if I'm doing that, then I am actually going to get much stronger and my offers are going to be taken up more often. So I'll create more activation, I'll create more acquisition, I'll create more retention. Um, and it's all by starting in that niche. Okay. Yep. So there's another way. Here's my contradiction. Ready? Um, I've actually done this in a number of <laughs> in a number of products um, of companies that have hired me when they couldn't 
find the niche, what we did was we created a niche. And how do you do that? You look at the people that aren't being served. So I'll give you an example. When uh, NBN comes out, right, and they start pitching, pitching, pitching NBN, all of a sudden people that aren't getting attention, that aren't going to be able to move as quickly, that aren't going to be interested in being an early adopter are the people who are in the top part of the bell curve, right? So, and that would be mm -hmm. your average. They actually adopt things later. So what you can do to create a, a really large niche, but it has a time frame or a cycle to it, is you can actually focus on the market that people are trying to take from. So I'm trying to take all these people who have landlines, right, and this other types of data services and move them to NBN. So now I've got all the competitors and they're all focused. So now their focus is like this, right? They're all, you know, jumping in and they're trying to get everybody to NBN. And so what we did with one company and created a massive, um, massive service for them was we put out marketing that said, we know NBN is coming, but until it gets here, we want to offer you the best possible deal and help you to feel comfortable that we're not going to try and convert you to NBN until you're ready, right? Because... In the top part of the bell curve, they make their own decisions, right? They're belongers. When everybody else goes, we'll go. <laughs> so so by, by simply doing that, we reversed the equation and said our niche market is now the biggest part of all of the market that's available right to talk to but we're actually going to approach them in a niche way and so what becomes the niche is the market and when you do that you can hack the hell out of a market and really create some incredible results the interesting thing is when you do something like that people trust you and so their natural inc inclination is to go with you when they are ready for nbn and that is exactly what happened with our client so we really broke the market by creating niche marketing instead of going after a niche marketplace. So I love doing that. As you can tell, my passion goes, dun, dun, dun. So much I'm listening to that. I'm like, oh my God, that's so freaking cool. It's like the personality type of the people in the top of that curve. They're like this. They're not going to go and buy it now. So how do we, how do we market to them now? How do we market to their personality? Yes, people who yes. are people who are students of the whole blue A blue ocean strategy sort of thing, they'd be going like, you just created a blue ocean, which is sort of what you did, you know, like boom. No, it's, it's it's called blue orgasm. Blue orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wondered, I've always wondered, you know the blue men, that blue men thing? I, do they have blue orgasms? Or is that just I me racially it. profiling now? You know, I've got a date with yeah. one this week and I'll find out. So <laughs> you know, a date with a blue man? How'd you no. get that? That would be I mean, interesting. Back in Sydney. It would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, it's sort of like it's sort of like natural redheads. You sort of wonder are they red red hair everywhere, and it's sort of like a blue men blue everywhere. Well, but you'd never really find out because most redheads are flat eyed crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even going to go there. <laughs> oh, man. Good. JJ, that's that's phenomenal. Thank you so much. And um, there, there are so many gems in there. Like it's um, – I'm, I'm going to have some – I'm going to get this whole the whole episode transcribed and um, – and let's see how much we can share. And, and, and but before we do that, where can where can people best connect with you? LinkedIn, Go Bowl Market. Where would, where where can they if they want to find out more and and say hey and have a conversation, yeah. see if they're the right personality type for you? Um, well, where can they connect? Best? Well, let me tell you, um, the people that that want to connect with me are probably people who. Um, want to find out, you know, how I can do something to help them. But there's one way that you can actually choose to connect with me very easily. If you've got a goal already, and you should always do this if you're going to hire a coach or a consultant, you should have your goal already. You should know what you want to achieve and know that when you talk to someone like myself or even yourself, you're going to get someone who's going to be very bold just the name of my company, Go Bold. You're going to get somebody who delivers on their promise, who's going to ask you the tough questions and make sure that what we're able to do is deliver 
on your promise to yourself. Um, and those are the type of people that would want to connect with me. I'm not for the squeamish, and that's why I say I'm an acquired taste. <laughs> um, but I think it's important uh, for people to know if they want to connect with me to ask some questions, please feel free to do that as well. And LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach me. Okay, cool. And um, do you have one of the wonderful, let me just quickly check, do you have one of those wonderful, van you do, JJ Ferrari 48. JJ and, Ferrari um, 48. There you go. So uh, linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash JJ Ferrari 48 if you uh, uh, need the shortcut. Otherwise, just go and Google it. That's it. I found a, on, on Instagram, I found a couple of JJ Ferraris who don't look anything like you. I think they might be, <laughs> I, I think they might be writing in on your name, man. Maybe, maybe. You know what? Imitation is the best form of flattery, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, totally. Okay, cool. So listen, thank you so much again for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege, and I love everything you've shared because it's, well, both personally and business, and they're one and the same, and you you personify that, 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 that idea that, who you are in business is who you are in, in person and, and vice versa. If you're not, you know, if, if one, if, if there's a disconnect between the two, then you're not being genuine. You're not being who you are. And you, uh, you are certainly both in one. So again, oh, thank you thank so you much. So much. I, I love hanging out with you anyway, Paul. So thank you for having me on. I love our conversations. So. Me too. Okay, guys, listen, if wherever you're seeing this, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, IGTV, um, like, subscribe, leave comments. We'll get back to com any comments anywhere. And um, yeah. if you want to reach out to JJ, please uh, go to LinkedIn uh, and um, I'll, put, I'll put the link to JJ's, uh, JJ's profile anyway, wherever you're seeing this. Okay. Have a great day again. Thanks so much. And JJ, thank you so much again. Um, and uh, we will be back again next week. Have Wonderful.